The Western Lacrosse Hall of Fame was created to honor, celebrate, and commemorate the influential players and coaches of the Western Lacrosse world. Whether it's a player or coach, these individuals have demonstrated the highest level of skills and achievement within their position of lacrosse. Additionally, these outstanding individuals are recognized as accomplished citizens and role models who live their lives with integrity and an unflappable moral compass. This is a great source of, of uh, pride for us at Adrenaline. It's something that we want to do for a number of years. There's a lot of uh, really great pioneers in the Western lacrosse world. Um, a lot of guys who I think paved the way for, for some of you guys. Um, I think that's okay to recognize that. Your achievements are not to be undercut by your skills. But there are guys who paved the way to help open doors for you. And uh, I'm very proud to have in this class two individuals that absolutely did that. They were groundbreaking within our sport. Uh, they were groundbreaking within their lives. And uh, they are no doubt uh, uh, deserving to be our first two that are recognized within the Western Lacrosse Hall of Fame. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to get into the honor of inducting uh, my good friend Peter Baum. While Peter's playing certainly speaks for itself, I'm going to outline how good he is for you guys here right now. He went to Lincoln High School in Oregon, where he was a two-time All-American. His senior year, he had 84 goals, 38 assists, with 52 ground balls. At his career uh, at Lincoln, he had 180 goals and 70 assists. He was the number 37 ranked top recruit for IL. A little bit low IL. Where's, uh, where's Josh? Kind of blew that one, guys, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was two-time All-State. Uh, when he went to Colgate, he was a four-year starter. He never missed one single game of lacrosse at Colgate. He was four-time All-Patriot League award winner. He was a three-time NCAA All-American. In 2012, he was the Patriot League Player of the Year. He's the all-time leader in goals and points at Colgate still with 164 goals and 225 points. He graduated magna cum laude, something I can barely pronounce, <laughs> which means he's extremely intelligent. He was the number one pick in the MLL draft. He was a four-time MLL All-Star. Uh, we had the privilege of him being a West Coast Stars player. He was also played for the Adrenaline Tropics, you can see. Some of those guys had a good time and, and, and certainly cut it up and got that brotherhood. Of course, he was also the first player from the West to win the Wartime Award and still the only player to win that award, which is the highest achievement in lacrosse, symbolizes the best player in the game. To have that come to a Western player at that time and still today is a huge, huge deal. So, you know, for me, when we were at Adrenaline and kind of watching his career and watching him at Colgate, and I've never watched more Colgate lacrosse in my life than when Peter was there, because we were just so darn proud of him. And, um, you know, just personally, I remember when he was graduating, and, and, you know, we were really getting our brand going pretty hard at that time. And, you know, I'd known Pete and seen him a bunch, and kind of talked in passing here or there, and I remember calling him up after he graduated and being like, hey, you know, what are your plans? Meanwhile, him, Expecting him to tell me, like, yeah, I'm going to go, you know, work on Wall Street. I just graduated from Colgate, you know, X, Y, and Z. And, you know, he said, well, I, I'm not sure yet. And I was like, huh. Well, how about you come work for Adrenaline and, you know, play in this, this thing we're starting off called LXM. And, you know, the thing I always respect about Peter is he's a very level-headed guy, right? So for me, it took some convincing, and for him to actually say yes to that meant a lot to me. It meant to me that he cared more about, you know, the Western game and giving back than going, you know, he was the number one pick in the MLL. He decided to play in the league that was starting up, and the point of that league was really to play pro games around the West and really showcase some of the best players in the world at tournaments in the West. For him to kind of commit to that after being the best player in the game um, really meant a lot. And for me, I remember those conversations and, and uh, you know, he was one of those guys who was very level-headed about his decision and was very focused on helping grow this game out west. And that means the world to me, and it's meant the world to our company. He worked for us for a good year and a half, and I remember when he came to my office, and, you know, he shut the door, you know, a little official, and 
kind of sat down and I'm just sitting there smiling like, yeah, man, you graduated from Colgate, magna cum laude. I know you're going to go do other things. You know? But he says, hey, I'm going to, you know, I've got another opportunity. I think I'm going to go to law school. And I go, buddy, I think that's a great decision. Couldn't, couldn't support it enough. And, uh, you know, I just want everyone in this room to recognize that it's not just about his playing. It's about him as a person. It's about him giving back to this Western sport. It's about him flying that flag proud. Um, I know he's going to be a successful lawyer. We're real proud of that, too. So. Hopefully you're not representing me anytime soon, but uh, <laughs> anyway, let's give a huge round of applause for Peter Rump. associated a law firm in LA, so <laughs> nice to be around lacrosse for the weekend. I appreciate it. Uh, and of course, congrats to all of you guys. Um, you know, this event is, is really about you um, embarking on your college careers. I can remember very vividly uh, when I was finishing up my, my senior year of high school and, and getting ready to play. And this event didn't exist yet. I was playing in the Under Armour game and, and all the energy and the excitement of getting ready to go off to college. and getting to speak to those of you I've spoken to so far tonight. Uh, really excited for you and your families. There's really nothing better. I mean, you see some of the highlights from the various uh, iterations of lacrosse I've played over the years. There's nothing better than playing those four years of college lacrosse. So I'm so excited for all of you, um, you know, Clark and Rourke, everybody here, Alex, who's played college lacrosse, they'll tell you it's truly, truly the most special, uh, the most special time for your lacrosse career, so we're really excited for all of you. Um, you know, being, being honored in this inaugural Western Lacrosse Hall of Fame class is really special to me. Um, first and foremost, because I've always tried to, to represent Western Lacrosse as best I can. I think um, there was a time when I would meet people, Colgate, for those of you who don't know, and I know some of you do and are very excited, uh, to head off is in upstate New York. Um, and so meeting people back east and you know they would ask where I was from, where, where I grew up playing lacrosse and I would say Portland, Oregon, you kind of get this like <coughs> up look on your face, um, people had no idea that they even played lacrosse in Portland, Oregon. People in Portland, Oregon used to ask if it was a butterfly net that I was carrying around, <laughs> <laughs> what this activity was that I'm doing, but now when I go back, um, you know, I think the number of high schools that have played in my home state has doubled. Um, there's some Oregon folks here tonight on the, the men's and women's side. It's great to see, and all these Western state, all these Western states. It's phenomenal. So that's the most you know exciting thing for me is just to see you know your excited budding faces as you head off to to a great career. And for me, um, there were a lot of people who came before me, uh, both inside the Adrenaline family and elsewhere. Um, I'm far from the first person to play Division One lacrosse uh, from the West. Uh, I had a lot of mentors, some of them are, are in this room. Uh, as Alex mentioned, I think um, this is so special for me because adrenaline does hold a really special place in my heart. Um, it was my first post-collegiate employer, uh, as Alex mentioned, which is, which is great. And I remember in seventh grade going to the adrenaline shootout. It was my first club tournament. Nobody, I didn't know what club lacrosse was. It was, you know, I played. I started playing in sixth grade and then I was going to this tournament in Sonoma and I had no idea that so many people played lacrosse from all, all sorts of different cities and towns all over the West um, and it was really special to see what it is now. Uh, you know, we're over sitting at this table remarking at some of the schools that you all are going off to and, you know, could not be more impressed. Um, up and down the list, we're just, we're so excited for all of you. And for me, I mean, Jono and Alex and Steve, this is what they do, you know. Um, Alex is from an area, an area that's a true and utter lacrosse blue blood hotbed, you know, Washington DC suburb, played lacrosse in Notre Dame. He could easily have had uh, like a snobby outlook, which, which so many people had for a long time from back east as, 
when it comes to Western players, but instead they chose to put roots down out west and really invest in all of us. And you know, I had a great career playing, you know, adrenaline tournaments, playing in LXM, working for the company, and to see you guys uh, enjoy this weekend with your families and, and get ready to go off is really special. So for me, this is special for everybody that's played lacrosse out west, um, and personally, just. Everything adrenaline has done for me, you know, it really means a lot. Uh, so we're excited to see you guys play tomorrow. I think that's, for me, that's what I'm most excited about. Uh, have fun, and if anybody has questions about college across, anything like that, please, uh, or law school. <laughs> it's great, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, so yeah, have a great weekend. Um, thank you for letting me be here and, and sharing your limelight a little bit. I really appreciate it, uh, and have a great weekend. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Before I introduce Rourke Denver, I just want to thank Alex, the Adrenaline Group, uh, for inviting me here to represent a great friend and teammate in Rourke Denver. And I'm listening to some of the things Alex is saying tonight, and it resonates for me, uh, because I think a lot of you are in a similar situation that I was in when I was a kid. I grew up in New York, in a town called Yorktown. It was a big time hotbed for lacrosse, but lacrosse, even in New York at that time, was fighting for like national recognition and legitimacy. So even though I grew up in this hotbed of a town where our idols typically weren't Emmett Smith or Michael Jordan, it was the guy on the varsity team who played at Syracuse, who I wanted to aspire to be like. So how does that pertain to you? Well, tonight we're honoring great individuals and Peter Baum and my teammate and friend, Rourke Denver. These guys were trailblazers. What they did was a lot harder than what I did. And I say that because I had so many people around me supporting me and the game meant a lot to my community. And I tell you this tonight because all of you are in an amazing opportunity to pay that forward with your communities. And I see some of you young guys and the adrenaline guys have a lot of the players who play for them come back in the summer. There is a little kid, just like when I was in Yorktown, New York, at nine years old, my parents moved from New York City, they had no clue what a lacrosse stick was. When I told my dad I didn't want to play baseball anymore, he said, what do you mean you don't want to play baseball? You know, we grew up right outside of Yankee Stadium for the first few years of my life. And for me, the sport of lacrosse meant so much because my idols and the people who I aspired to be were in my own community. And I think that's really important for all of you, that when you go back to your community, and whether you're the girls or the boys here, you've done amazing stuff. Like capture this moment in time right now, like reflect tonight, tomorrow, like what you've done. In a day and age where so many kids are you know, fighting for what's next, like reflect on what's now right now because this is super cool. And I'm listening to these schools that you guys are all going to. It's amazing. That's a combination of your hard work, your parents' sacrifices, and your ability to dream. And Rourke, my friend and teammate at Syracuse University, we're gonna watch a video on him in just a minute. And when he called me to tell me that he wanted me to introduce him to this Western Lacrosse Hall of Fame, I got chills because from a teammate standpoint, and I'll talk a little bit more about him after the video, it was one of the biggest no-brainers in terms of an ask in many years. And when I had the opportunity to kind of go through my journey and work being part of that journey because we played together for three years at Syracuse, he was one year older than me, it allowed me to reflect. So I'm just telling you all tonight, reflect on your journey and you're in the middle of an amazing journey. I mean, I'm 44 years old right now, and I stand up here, I would trade places with all of you, because once you get into the real world, once you get into the grind, whether you're in law school or you're an ESPN commentator, it's not this. This is, this is where you want to be. So just understand that and appreciate that. So we're gonna watch a video on Rourke, and then I'm gonna say a few words about Rourke, and we'll bring him up to the stage. So enjoy the video.
When I think back to my time at Syracuse University, I arrived as a freshman in the fall of 1993. Rourke Denver was a sophomore. And Rourke mentioned in that speech on the video two teams that he's so grateful to be part of. One is Syracuse University, one is the Navy SEALs. And when I tell you from a teammate standpoint, you couldn't ask for a better teammate. And tonight I just want to share a few things about Rourke Denver that can apply to you. And if you can walk away from me talking to you tonight and be a better teammate because of that, it's a win in my book. The one thing that really resonated right away for me when I thought of Rourke's journey was risk taking. He took a risk. Here's a kid from the Bay Area, San Francisco. He played water polo growing up, never picked up a lacrosse stick, had an opportunity to join the club team as a sophomore, fell in love with the game, and took a risk. And that risk was going to a Syracuse lacrosse camp as a high school kid to get recognized from the state of California. And when I tell you the state of California then was not a hotbed for lacrosse <laughs> in the early 90s. He took a chance because he believed in himself. And you're all going to be in a situation in the coming months that you're gonna to have to take chances and risks when you approach this next endeavor in life. And for Rourke to do that, and to show up at Syracuse University, a team that was flooded with high school All-Americans from traditional powers like my hometown in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. I mean, having a kid from California on that team was like eye-opening. And I've been commentating since 2004, and even in the early stages of my broadcasting career, when I would see a kid from California, 10 years later than work, I'd say, wow, what's this guy doing here? But because of his trailblazing mindset and his ability to take risks, he planted a foundation for all of you. And you're going to have to take some risks. You're going to be approached by some tough situations in life. In the next few months, you're going to a totally new place that's foreign to you. Take some risks. That's the first thing. When I think of Rourke showing up at Syracuse University lacrosse camp, not knowing what that next step would be for him. Maybe it was going to be playing water polo for the rest of his life because he's an accomplished water polo player. He loved the game of lacrosse, so he took the risk. He bet on himself. You all need to bet on yourself in this next stage. There's going to be times where you doubt yourself, but bet on yourself like Rourke did. The second thing that came to mind that can apply to you is don't flinch. Here's a kid that did everything in high school from a lacrosse standpoint. He's the only All-American from his region at the time. Goes to Syracuse University, plays in the North-South All-Star game, the high school game back then. Scores a bunch of goals. Goes to Syracuse. Plays midfield his freshman year. Coach Simmons knows that as good as Rourke is, there's Don Fenn, who's the national midfielder of the year. There's Roy Colsey, who's the national midfielder of the year. Two of them on the same team. And then there's Charlie Lockwood, who was a first team All-American, but not later on in his career because Roy Colsey and Don Fenn were there. So how is Rourke Denver going to get on the field? Well, Coach Simmons gives him a long pole. Never played long pole in his life. He doesn't flinch. Plays a little his sophomore year, he's in the regular rotation. His junior year, his senior year, he's an All-American and my captain. And when I say my captain, the following year, I was fortunate enough to be one of the two captains at Syracuse. It was really easy for me to understand how to lead when I had worked Denver the year before me. I had this guy in my locker room. And when I think back to my journey, and I think about people who influenced me, people who you look at and you're like, wow, that's the way to do it. It's not a surprise that he's such a decorated Navy SEAL. It's not a surprise that he's a best-selling author. It's not a surprise that he goes across the country and speaks. It's because he's real. So he didn't flinch. You all will go to school. The girls, the boys, your position might change. It might change your first year, your second year, your third year. Don't flinch. Be a teammate because at the end of the day, it's not about what Rourke did. At this point in time in my life, at 44, I don't care how many ground balls he scooped. I don't care how many takeaways he had. I think of him as the teammate. It's because of his selfless attitude in playing lacrosse. 
And that's what it's all about. When you reflect years from now, when you think of your teammates, you think of those attributes. And then the other thing that came to mind when I was thinking of Rourke, hard working at all costs. You all are super competitive. I mean, these schools that you are going to, we're sitting at the table and I'm laughing. I'm like, I can't get to any of these schools, bro. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You've worked really hard. This isn't a mistake that you're here tonight. It's not a mistake that Rourke is so accomplished in everything in his life. It's hard work. And sometimes hard work's not cool. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're gonna be that guy or that girl that needs to put in the extra time and some of your friends on the team might say, really, you're gonna do that? Yeah, if it means you accomplishing your end goal, do it. Who cares what anyone else thinks? Be different, be a trailblazer. And that's what Rourke did. He's always approached life with that mindset. And tonight I sit here so proud. I was exchanging texts with my brother who played lacrosse at Johns Hopkins, who knows Rourke well as a person, hasn't seen him in probably 20 something years. And when I told him I was here doing this, his response, and he's one of those guys that sends like the long text, you know people send long text. <laughs> I'm a really short text exchanger, like sounds good. And then he says to me, what do you mean sounds good? Well, his response, wow. <laughs> so that said a lot to me. That one word described what I'm doing tonight for my friend and my teammate. I'm going to bring him up here right now. Decorated Navy SEAL, Captain, All-American, and for you all, a Western Lacrosse Trailblazer, Mark Denver. choices. I think about the choices I've, I've made and, and what that kind of led to. And, and it's funny, you get to a certain stage of your life, you kind of reflect and, and, and you'll puzzle at some of the choices you made. I, as I was getting ready, you know, I got my, my buddy Paul who was just up here talking on my behalf, which I'm so humbled that you agreed to do. And then I've got, uh, I've got two other good friends of mine that joined me tonight. One's uh, uh, kind of a, a person I work with in business, but has become a mentor, a friend, almost family. Another one's a SEAL teammate that uh, I'll get emotional if I just start talking anything about him in some ways. But uh, the choices that kind of highlighted my mind tonight were, were becoming a SEAL. And so my, my buddy that, that I've known through business, he called me and said, what are you wearing tonight? I said, you know, boots, slacks, uh, college shirt, and sport coat. My SEAL, t SEAL teammate called me, he's like, what are you wearing tonight? And I was like, I I don't travel with my concealed carry rig, so I'm on our. If he doesn't yeah, skip a beat, he's like, you want me to bring you up? <laughs> I think we're good, so you'll see where the choices take me. These little nuanced choices, but you'll see where they go. But um, I think the greatest debt we owe is, as, as you know, kind of young men and women, and then, then as we kind of move forward in our life, is to thank those that help you get where where you've got, right? And so thanks are like super important to me. I get emotional when I thank these people because I care so much for who they helped me become. And so for tonight, Kark, you know, means the world to me that he showed up. I mean, he's just one of the, obviously you all know him better than probably anybody in this room. I mean, he's a legend in this sport because of, of what he's bled into it, and given to it, and, and helped nurture. I mean, I saw young lions come up and hug him um, for what he's done to kind of help blaze a path for them. So I'm, I'm honored you were here tonight uh, to, to Alex. I mean, this guy and I met, um, you know, we played in the same era, uh, didn't see each other all that often on the field, but then met back up when our kiddos started going to school together. Uh, he was that champion for Western Lacrosse, and what you've done for this company and, and establishing this is, is, is just hugely special um, to Adrenaline, the whole team, the rest of the folks behind the scenes that are making this happen. Uh, I tip my cap to you, um, to Peter, to have a, a player of that, that caliber to share the stage for the first time. Uh, it's as good as it gets. And then since I know this is being recorded, um, to, my, to my mom, 
my mom who, uh, who taught me and my brother that like literally anything is possible. She's just an artistic dreamer uh, that, that made us believe that. My dad knew how to do the work to get there, so the discipline and intensity he kind of put into my brother and I, my brother just being my partner in crime, getting to that point. And then very, very finally, my, my bride and my girls, my bride's my heartbeat, my girls are my fuel, and life's good, so hopefully no more emotion. But, uh, yeah. So Alex asked me to, to, to spend a little more time, so he kind of gave me the, 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 the honor to spend a little more time and, and, and really kind of address the young lines in the room. And I, and I mean this um, very, very sincerely. It is for the guys and the gals. I want to talk to both of you. I obviously skew uh, on the aggressive side of, fem uh, of males because that's just the, the place I've been marinated in, but I've got two daughters, so I'm telling you, women's lacrosse is going to be far more important to me from this point moving forward. So I'm talking about that. The one that everybody like nuked about was the like through the legs female style. <laughs> so uh, I love telling stories. I said that in the video and now I feel like I'm paraphrasing it, but I love telling stories because I feel like that's how we've communicated lessons across centuries, right? Old gray beards, which I'm actually now growing, uh, is how we would teach young folks lessons and, and parables and things about life. So I'm gonna share a story. I've got a little bit uh, left after that, and then I'm gonna get out of your hair. And I'll get plenty of time with you tomorrow as well. Um, the very first uh, or the very last assault team I led led in the SEAL teams to make the math easy That's about 20 folks about 20 shooters 20 assaulters that are going to be part of that that combat unit. Okay It's actually less than that when you think about it because it's you have the assault team leader in this case It was me. You've got the senior enlisted advisor Which is a chief or a senior chief which one of my teammates here is that that guy that's going to kind of run the platoon You're going to do that together You've got two junior officers, they're gonna run squads, and they're gonna be ready to become assault team leaders in the next round. And then the Navy got what's called a, a, an LPO, or a leading petty officer, that'll become that chief leadership. So when you take over a team, it's about 20 guys, but it really comes down to about 15, 16 trigger pullers, shooters, that are gonna be doing the, the actual job when you're leading them over in combat, okay? When you take over a new team, if you got five new guys, about five new guys, that'd be perfect. That'd be a perfect number of new guys to go in. You got about you know, 10, 12 or so that are actually gonna help mentor them, bring them into the fold and get them moving forward to succeed and, and perform at a high level. You start getting to six or seven, you're gonna get a little, a little, you get to seven, you're gonna get twitchy about how many new guys you get. You hit eight, you're gonna freak out. The last assault team I took over, I got 11. 11 of 15. I thought it was a practical joke. I walked in my operations officer's office, I'm like, there's no way I got 11 new guys. I said, you got 11 new guys work out, that's the way it worked. And I was freaked out about it, to be honest. We ended up going on a combat deployment in the summer of 2006, it's become a legendary deployment, kind of in our inner circle of what we did, you know, in our time on the battlefield. Medal of Honor came out of that, countless silver stars, purple hearts, bronze stars, combat action ribbons, I mean, more, more combat distinctions that you can throw a stick at, and much more so that that's, that stuff's kind of notional, the way we look at things. The impact that it had on the battlefield was otherworldly, the way it, it, it kind of changed the face of that combat theater in Iraq. <coughs> But when I came back from that deployment, I was very curious why that went as well as it went. I'm a little bit of a tinkerer. I like knowing why things happen. So I came back, I was like, look, it clearly wasn't just my exceptional leadership that led that team to you know, high distinction. There was something else going on there. And so when I started thinking about it, it actually brought me back to when Paul and I played at Syracuse. So I called my coach. I said, hey, coach, do you have all the statistics for the years that I played at Syracuse? He said, yeah, of course. I said, can you send them to me? I said, you bet. So he sends me you know, a couple of our uh, media packets, got all the stats for the year. And I found out something kind of interesting. In the four years that I played at Syracuse, we won the national championship twice. Two years, we fell one game short. In the two years that we did not win the national championship, did not win the national championship, on paper, we were better. Better shot percentage by our offense. We won more ground ball, balls. Our goalie had a higher save rate. Noticeably better in the years we didn't win the national championship which is kind of interesting. So I, I start kind of piecing it together and I, I feel like I connected the dots. I am utterly convinced the years we won the national championship at Syracuse, it was the freshmen that won those championships. It was the freshmen. And I gotta qualify that because at this era at Syracuse, very few freshmen ever saw the field. One or two a year maybe was in a starting position or, or, or a secondary role. Usually for the most of us, when we were 10 goals up with two minutes left, he throw all the freshmen and you get a chance to play because you could not screw it up at that point. <laughs> but what I found was the years we won the national championship, the freshmen were so hungry 
They wanted to get on that field so bad and, and clawed and fought to be in that position that what does that do to all the starters? Hugely elevates their play. Hugely elevates their play. They're not about to give up their position to a rookie, but because of that, the team's performance went through the roof. It went through the roof. It was the same thing in the SEAL teams. We had, we, we had young minds, kind of, you know, fresh blood, look at the battlefield. How do we solve problems? How do we adapt technology and move, move the, the entire system of war forward? And so I share this with you, particularly for you young minds that are about to become freshmen, you're about to become rookies, that, that there is no such thing as a rookie. You can win national championships. You can take an immediate impact position in a leadership role if you want to go do that. And if you fall short, still make sure your pursuit of those positions is so intense that someone has to defend their spot like a lion to keep you off the field. I'm telling you right now, it'll elevate the play of the team through the roof. Freshmen have won national championships across every sport in the NCAA world. Basketball, football, the biggest games, the biggest stage, freshmen have brought teams to victories. You can do that. It's on you. And the one thing you can guarantee it is you can't win your way to winning and you can't start your way to starting. You can work your way to starting. That's it. You grind. You grind and work hard, you're going to find yourself on the field. Yeah? And if you don't find yourself on the field, if you do that, you will elevate the team through the roof. Through the roof. All right. So whether you, you, you know, kind of go down the religious path, whatever that might be, I love quotes and, and, and passages from the Bible. Whether you like adhere to that book matters not. There's like such good lessons in there, it's insane. And so one of the, uh, you know, it talks about the vices. And the worst vice of all the vices is advice, but I'm about to give you some. <laughs> so I'm gonna keep this very simple. Learn to fix stuff. Learn to fix stuff. Like if you need to call a plumber, an electrician, or somebody to come over to the house, that's a shame. You should be able to fix, be careful with electricity. But you should know how to use tools. You should know how to use tools and fix things. So if you don't know what an impact driver is, a grinder, or a reciprocal saw, you should. All right, figure that out. You find that duct tape and a couple screwdrivers. There's basically nothing on earth you can't fix. Learn how to fix things. Vaseline. I am relatively confident Vaseline is made by magical elves in some like pixie forest because it is not from planet Earth. The uses of that, just Google uses for Vaseline. Here's the one I like the most. I spend an inordinate amount of time in different combat boots, hiking up like steep mountains with exceptionally heavy gear, and you start getting blisters, okay? Should you get a blister breaking in a new pair of shoes, take your shoe off, take your socks off. Now that I've said it, you're gonna have Vaseline with you. You take a huge dollop of Vaseline, slap it on the, on the blister, put your sock back on, put your shoe back on, go back to work. Call me in the morning, you'll see what happens. <laughs> stitches and casts, stitches and casts. If at this point in your life you haven't had either stitches and or a cast, you are not playing hard. <laughs> read, read, be a reader. Whether you're taking stuff through podcasts, things like that, it's a great medium for information. There is nothing more powerful than reading. Every person that is a detailed, deep, voracious reader that I have met in my life is just smarter than everybody else that isn't. The magic of reading is just you have a gift of, of, of thoughts, ideas, guidance on how to kind of see the world and think about the world. Be a reader. If you meet another one, you'll never have nothing to talk about. And it's a special, special thing. Please read. Please read. Learn to fight. This world, particularly here at home in the United States, has kind of insulated all of us from suffering and pain and, and, and roughness. And I think that's a mistake. Suffering and pain and struggling, that's where the lessons are. That's where the good stuff comes from. But when it comes to fighting, an actual fight, at some point you might need to do it and or feel compelled to protect somebody that can't protect themselves. There are two types of people in a fight. The person that believes they know how to fight and the person that has prepared, learned, and taught themselves to fight. You want to be the latter. Okay. <laughs> simplicity, simplicity. There are all these complex things happening in the world and the best people you can get around will be able to make them very, very simple. Your best professors will be able to do this. They'll take exceptionally complex issues and make it simple. Try and uh, endeavor to do this in your own life. If you go to explain something to someone or do an elevator pitch to try and get a job, and you can't do it on a half page or a single piece of paper, you do not understand it well enough, go back to the drawing board, understand it better, and keep it simple. Abraham Lincoln needed 287 words to craft the Gettysburg Address. Google and read the Gettysburg Address. If you can say more with that, that few words, I would love to see it. Keep things simple. 
Favor action over inaction. This is something we learn on the battlefield very, very early. Doing something is about the only thing that counts. You can even do it wrong. If you do it with a lot of aggression and confidence, it's gonna go better than if you do nothing, okay? Favor action over inaction. Make a call, take a shot. Make the pass that you think should go. Go after the ball. Action over inaction. I'm almost there. Manners. This is exceedingly important and we seem to be losing it by the day. Now, Texas and in the South, that is not the case. People seem to value that here, but all around the rest of the country, manners are, are starting to go away. For the young lads in the room, day one stuff is obviously opening the door for a young lady or saying, yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. The advanced course, and you don't see this much anymore, but if you were on a date and your, your date stands up, stand up as well when she's going to the restroom, then sit back down. The room, the restaurant will start looking at you like you're an absolute crazy person. And then she'll come back, you stand up again when she comes to the table and you sit down with her. What you'll see then from the room is a whole bunch of dudes that hate you and a whole bunch of gals that are like, I wish I were sitting with that guy. Maybe I should have saved that for last, but here's the last one. This is, this is my last one. This is the best piece of advice my dad ever gave me. This is for both the guys and the gals. Learn to cook. This is not rocket science. It's pretty easy to cook some good stuff, but here's the piece of advice. Should you have the confidence on a date to say you're gonna cook for that person, this is what you do. About 10 minutes before they arrive at the location you're gonna cook at, you take a quarter stick of butter. You put that quarter stick of butter in a saute pan on simmer. You chop up one clove of garlic, drop it into the butter. When your date walks into that location, they're gonna be like, whoa, it smells fantastic. You could be preparing PB and J sandwiches and you're gonna knock it out of the park if you do this butter garlic. All right, so I got, I got, I got one thing left. I thank all of you, both guys and gals, for, for what you're gonna do tomorrow. When you play, when you get out on that field and you play, and you play, play your tails off, you basically like allow us, those of us that can't run as fast as you anymore, can't move as fast, and remember being those shoes. You like bring us back to life. It's like we're born again watching you play. I will be in your shoes tomorrow. Paul will be in your shoes tomorrow. Peter can still run, but like, no kidding. <laughs> It, it lets us live again, and anybody that's my age or older knows exactly what I mean. So I thank you for that. I thank you for giving us that, and I can't wait to see it tomorrow. Uh, I talked about choices at the beginning of this speech. What I'll tell you is, you made an unbelievable choice picking this as your game. That there is no game like this. I mean, I'm sure everybody that plays every other sport would say the same thing. I just happen to be right. <laughs> this game is unique. It, 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 is, it is like bred with a different kind of spirit than any other sport you can possibly play. And the stick is the thing that binds it. I mean, that is a birthright to an entire nation. That thing is a tool. It's a weapon. Our connection to it is otherworldly. It's art in and of itself. And it's unbelievably both the brush and the canvas. And you get to paint whatever masterpiece you want with it. I'm honored to be amongst you. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you guys very much.